We've been studying combinational logic. In chapter 6, we began to play with flip-flops. They have some memory. We began to climb out of this box and into this one called finite state machines. In chapter 7, we're going to talk about a million more finite state machines. And then in chapter 8, we're going to talk about algorithmic state machines. And then in chapter 9, we're going to talk about asynchronous sequential networks. We're not going to cross this boundary right here into pushdown automaton. Pushdown automaton is like, like algebraic notation. It's parsing. It's figuring out what comes first, plus or multiplication, what the parentheses mean, what stacks mean. And then crossing this boundary gets us into if commands, branching, go to, does it stop, does it hang, does it do a loop forever. So if you think about an if command, can we see an if command in here? Yeah, you'd have to parse it. You have to have the word if and a beginning and an end. Can we see an if command here in the finite state machine? Sort of, but it's getting fuzzy. There are seven steps to go through these finite state machine design process. Um, we're going to look at those seven steps. There's two basic branches of finite state machines, Mealy and Moore. Uh, we're going to explore their differences, and they'll help us build algorithmic state machines in Chapter 8. We're going to look at two examples, and then three word problems, and then we're going to dive into the details of the middle steps here that are, that are the most complicated. One's called the implicant state table, and the other's called the transition table. In Chapter 6, at the second half, we built these circuits out of flip-flops that flashed the LEDs in patterns. Zigzag, you know, gave them crazy names. And there were real no inputs and no outputs, unless you call the state of the flip-flop, the memory of the flip-flop, the output. And things just went around in circles as a clock ticked. It went from one pretty pattern to the next. What we're going to do in Chapter 7 is add inputs and outputs to our memory. So this is our finite state machine introduction. This is our synchronous sequential network introduction. What we're going to do is build circuits that look like this. The toughest thing to understand is the role of the combinational logic and the role of memory. Everything goes here at the speed of light. Then it hits a brick wall called the clock. Clock says, close your eyes. Don't look at the inputs. See, the inputs right here get combined with the present state and generate our new J's and K's and our new T's and D's. And their values are being presented at the inputs of the flip-flops. You see, the inputs of the flip-flops are on this side the opposite side of normal in these diagrams. But the flip-flop doesn't look at them. It continuously puts out its memory right here. So these, the current memory right here combined with our inputs creates our next state, our next queue. So our current queue right here is coming out here. It's being combined with our inputs by a function f, right, our combinatory circuits right here. So this q plus is being delivered here. All the details necessary to create our next q is being delivered here to our flip-flops, but it's not being looked at. So when the clock tells the memory to look at the j and the k representing the next q plus, or look at the d representing the next q plus, then it changes its memory and our current cues then change and then begin combining with the inputs to create our next Q plus and to create our Z. In chapter six, our output was just dependent upon the present state. Now what we're doing is we're expanding and we're saying that Z could also be combining with inputs to create an output. In chapter 6, we took the memory of our flip-flops and we sent it straight to our outputs. Now what we're saying is we can mix our inputs with that memory to create our output. That's called melee. But that has problems because if our inputs change, 
asynchronously, then the output's going to change asynchronously while these things are being clocked. So we're going to look at some of the problems with Mealy. But what it does is it makes Mealy very fast. More is more conservative. Our output is just coming from our flip-flops. The inputs have to trickle through the J's and the K's, the D's, the T's, the SR's, into our flip-flops, and our output then could be affected by changing the state of the flip-flop. So this is more conservative, but it works. You're going to fall in love with Mealy, then you're going to fall back in love with more. Okay, here are the seven steps that are going to guide us through chapter seven, eight, and nine. You've already learned the bottom two. You learned how to create a circuit from Carnot maps. That's basically all this is. At the tail end of chapter six, we began creating excitation tables, and we couldn't directly ask Logisim to put a flip-flop into our circuit. We had to restrict logicism to just building the combinatory part of it for us. And we had to go back and add our flip-flops later. So that's the only tricky thing here. So you know the bottom two green things here. Word problems, yeah, you've been battling them. And they're going to still be just as painful as introduction to engineering, where you had to figure out what the problem statement meant, what the, what the client wanted, and reinterpret everything that's being said, parsed through all the crazy language of the actual application that's happening. That's half of chapter seven. It's just going from here to here. But to get started, what we're going to do is we're going to start at the bottom in this comfortable zone right here and work our way up. Oh, uh, twice with two examples, a melee example and a more example. So we're going to be reverse engineering. We're going to be troubleshooting. How do we troubleshoot a pre-existing circuit? How do we start inside of a circuit a previous engineer was designing? Um, it's, this is the easier stuff. Reverse engineering is uh, much easier than starting from the top and designing our way down. But that's what we're heading for. We want to start at the top and design our way down, but we're going to practice going up first. So here's our starting point, this circuit right here. And our first step is just to create equations for it. So we need an equation for D1. We need an equation for D2. And we need an equation for our z. So d1 is going to have, uh, let's see, we just trace the circuit. So it's going to be x bar and, let's chase this thing around, and q2 bar. So this is d1, not x and not q2. Or, so here's the or coming into d1, or these are anded together also. So this is a, what is this? Not Q1, and this is Q2. So it's D1 is not Q1 and Q2. So we just follow that, and we have to create a, uh, an expression here for D, function for D, a function for D2, and a function for Z. These are our three combinatory circuits, one, two, and three. Now, when we're working our way down from the excitation table, what we're doing is we're looking at the Carnot maps, building out these com these three combinatory circuits, and then adding in our flip-flops. Here we can see x and x bar influencing the output z. x bar and x influencing the output z. This makes this circuit mealy. This is the circuit that has problems. When x is not forced to go through these flip-flops, forced to obey the clock, it can asynchronously cause glitches out here on Z. This is our second example. We're going to alternate back and forth between example 7.1 and 7.2. In this second example, our outputs, we actually have two outputs now, Z1 and Z2, but they're both determined entirely by our Qs. They're both entirely determined by our flip-flops. And we have an extra input also, x and y, but they're being forced to move through the flip-flops. So this is called a Moore circuit, and it's inherently a bit more stable. This Moore circuit's drawback is that it takes a while for x and y to get through the flip-flop. It takes at least a clock tick, and 
if you start stringing these out not in parallel like this, but you start stringing them out in series, and you don't know what the software is doing with them, they can add a delay that keeps piling up, you know, delay after delay after delay after delay, and pretty soon the sound's not in sync with the video. Once we have the equations for our circuit, then what we can do is build this table, these column headings, present state, excitation, and output, and we can start filling in all the possible states of the two flip-flops. So if we're at this row, then this is an input, this is an input, this is an intermediary step right here, and then this is our output. This is the intermediary step where we set up our flip-flops waiting for a clock tick. So this is the waiting that goes on, waiting for clock tick. That's this Q1, Q2, all these, all this right-hand side of the equal sign being set up and waiting for a clock tick. We can tell this is mealy because our output is potentially influenced by our input. We actually have the input being mentioned right here. So let's just talk our way through this. Let's suppose we're at this state 0, 0 right here, and we get an input of 0, so that sticks us to right here, and we sit here and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. Our next Q is going to be determined, Q1 and next Q2 are going to be determined by this 1 and 0, this D1 and D2 going into those flip-flops. Our output is sitting right here waiting, already displayed because this is melee. It's already influencing the world. But this one zero hasn't gotten through the flip-flops yet, and when it does, when the clock ticks, we move down to this row right here. And because we move instantly, and that zero hasn't changed, and instantly our output changes to a one. Keep assuming that our cues are right here, and our, out, our input x is still right here, then on the next clock tick, we're just going to stay here. We're just going to stay here over and over and over again. We're just going to stay on this line. We're going to go back and forth on this line. Nothing's going to change. So you should be able to talk your way through one of these excitation tables. Okay, so now we're on example two. It's a little bit more complicated because we have our JKs. It's a little bit simpler because it's more. There's just one possible output for a given state. We don't have two columns like we did with the melee over here. So here we have one, two, three, four inputs. That gives us a 16 row truth table. So for 0, 0, there's going to be one, two, three, four rows. For 0, 1, there's going to be one, two, three, four rows. For 1, 0, so there's one, two, three, four, eight, twelve, sixteen. Each of these then represents one of the 16 rows in the truth table, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six outputs. So this is a little bit more complicated than what we were doing at the end of chapter six. Clearly this is more because the outputs only influenced by Q1 and Q2. Our inputs X and Y are not mentioned here because they're not influencing our output. Z1 and Z2 do not mention X or Y. So we're bouncing back and forth between example one and example two. We're starting off here at the circuit and working our way up in this reverse engineering process. So we looked at the melee circuit where our input was influencing our output. We looked at our more circuit where the output was just determined by the, uh, the memory of our flip-flops. We looked at the excitation table for our melee, where the input was influencing the outputs. We looked at the excitation table for our more, where the inputs were not affecting our output at all. And I want to rapidly go through the rest of these so you can see the alternation. So here we go, melee, more, melee, more, melee, more, melee, more, Mealy, more. Next up is our pass through the transition table.